Home labs don't have to be super duper complicated. This could potentially be your first cyber home lab. What I've got on the screen here is a very simple setup. I've got a, a client and I've got a router that has two different networks. And then I've got a server on one of those networks and they're separated via network segmentation. One of these machines over here, the client can go to the internet and then we're gonna make sure that this server cannot go to the internet. It's not overly complicated. And what I wanna stress while we're doing this process is that taking note of the specific learnings that we are that we're doing, let's dive right into this very straightforward cyber lab and go through some of, some of the specifics. I'm not gonna be going and installing PFSense from scratch. I've got a couple of the videos. I've got one on the screen there, and I got one on the screen there. Those two videos actually show how to set up PFSense in VirtualBox and also setting up PFSense in VMware. It's up to you, whatever your virtualization solution is, go for it. All that really matters is that we're setting up a, a good environment uh, for networking. Okie dokie. Let's go through and actually look at and talk a little bit about the, the considerations that we are making here when we're getting our PFSense set up. So I'm going to get my, my PFSense here. So this is just the basic uh, PFSense uh, terminal that we have here. I can access all of that good stuff from here. A NAT interface, a LAN interface, and a OPT1 interface. Let's go to our settings. So these are, these are some of the considerations you might want to make when doing your PFSense. I, I typically set up in the, the exact same way all the time because it, it, it works. The system, I've currently got it set to one gig. This is this is plenty for this lab. This is, a, this is in fact more than is necessary. You could do 512 megabytes, so a half a gig of memory for this PFSense in this particular lab. But depending on what you want to do, you might want to amp it up a bit. If you're going to be setting up uh, intrusion detection that's going to be, or intrusion prevention that's going to be requiring a bit more uh, resources, then obviously use some more use some more memory for that purpose. I always bump the hard disk to the very first in the boot order, and that's good because when I'm installing PFSense for the first time, it's going to go to the boot order. It's going to say, go to the hard disk. And say, is there an operating system here? And it's going to say, nope, it's not. Go to the next thing, which is going to be that ISO file for PFSense. Then it goes through the the installation process. Turn the machine off, turn it back on, and then it's going to go to the boot order. And it's going to go to the hard disk, and it's going to say, "Hey, is there an operating system here?" And it's going to say, "Yes, there is." <laughs> bang, bang, boom! Here we are. The other piece that really you're going to want to consider is your network. In this particular lab environment, I have my NAT set as my first adapter. That's what I do every single time I create a PFSense. And I want to have a WAN interface because you need one for this router setup. Set up WAN as NAT as your first adapter. Honestly, I've seen so many PFSense setups where NAT is put as like the third. It's, it's sort of it can work, but it's a little icky. So make it first. Second adapter is going to be in this particular case an internal network. I've given it a name. You can give it whatever name you want, whatever makes sense for you. LAN one if you want. I call it PF one just because. Dealing with PFSense, I like that. Uh, and then my third adapter is going to be also a internal network, and I'm going to be I call it PF2, just so I can differentiate the the two the two uh, internal networks. And and really, that's all that's all we really need. In the videos that I have uh, available for you guys, uh, I go through setting up the the LAN, and I also go through up setting up the DHCP pool. Now that's, that's important because you want to make sure that you're considering what is it that this machine can do? Do I want this IP address to be set statically or do I want it to be set up dynamically? And in this case, in my LAN, I want it to be dynamic. So I think it, I gave it a pool of uh, 192, let's look at the IP address over here, 192.168.89.10 to 254, that's my pool of addresses. Meaning also that two through nine are reserved for a static use, okay? I didn't say one in that case, but that's because my gateway is set to dot one. 
I need a gateway in order to get out of my network. So I'm actually set up dynamically. We can also confirm that inside of our settings. So I hit the Windows button here, go down to Advanced Networking. And in this particular case in Cali, you can configure your network manually to be manually or static. It doesn't, whatever's, whatever suits your purpose for your, your lab. In this case, I want it to be dynamic. So I have it set to automatic DHCP. When this machine boots up, it's going to go to the DHCP server that's living in my, my router here. And it's going to say, hey, I need an IP address. And the DHCP server is going to say, hey, I've got some IP addresses. You want one? <laughs> and it's going to give it to it. And it's going to say, hey, oh, yeah, give me some of that IP address. And boom, we've got ourselves an IP address. The difference here is that in my opt one network, so my server here, I don't want my server to be dynamically set. I actually want it to be manually configured. So we actually went, I went into my Debian server here and set up the IP address manually. Now there's some commands that you can do to, to do this. You can also potentially do it through the exact same process as we did in uh, Kali that we saw. You can go to advanced networking, wait for that to open. And in this case, we don't see we don't see my IP address, but we do have it. We do have it set. This is how I set up the IP address using the terminal. We're gonna do IP ADDR add. I'm gonna choose the IP address that I want. It has to be in the right network as well. Remember, opt one is the 50 network, so it'll be three slash 24. And we are also gonna choose the correct interface. So in this particular case, my interface is. ENP0S3, ENP0S3, hit enter, and it's going to change your IP address. And let's confirm that we can reach across and touch this machine. So I sent a ping or an ICMP packet across from my Kali over here, over to my Debian server. Uh, and on this server, I actually have a SSH server running. So I want to connect to it just to confirm that I have this. Andrew at 192.168.50.2. It's going to ask for my password. I can use my lab password. Bing, bang, boom. Here we are. So we've, we've connected. I'm actually able to manipulate this machine uh, via SSH. Nothing really fancy there doing the practicing of setting up a remote service on another machine is, is really good now i also said that we could go to the internet so let's go ahead and do that bing bang boom we are able to get to the internet through cali and the pf sense which is great let's go over to our debian machine here and talk a little bit about the configuration there so one thing i like about this as being a first cyber lab is that it's the fundamentals of networking that we're, we're playing with here. Really, installing SSH is as easy as apt-get install open SSH. And then you can use the defaults. In this particular case, I'm just using the defaults. And that's okay because it's our, it's our, first, it's our first cyber lab. And that's, that's fine. The nice thing is, though, is that it allows us to have a basic setup, but then also go ahead and have... Uh, foundation to allow for more complexity to be added. Things that I would do moving forward in this lab is that I would go in and really do sort of like a gap analysis on this SSH. Like, what are what is the best practices for SSH? Sounds like another video, <laughs> right? But uh, we're not going to do that today. What I want to show you is that we can get a basic default setting, have it functioning. You saw it functioning. But the next steps would be to like really dig into the security around particular services and practice that skill. Now let's go into our PFSense router and look at some of the firewalls that are in place there. I'm going to go to this 192.168. Yeah. We're going to fly over into our PFSense here. I think I can actually expand this, make it a little bit easier to see. Log in. All I've got here is two interfaces that have machines on each of them. What I care about right now is because I don't have anything else set up here. I don't have Snort or Suricatus configured. All I've got is a firewall managing the traffic. So let's go to our rules here. So firewall, rules, I'm going to go to LAN, 
Nothing needs to change in the WAN. It's good the way it is. Let's go to LAN. Ignore PF Blocker. Those are just some blockers that I've got set. Those are good and I like having them. But let's take a peek at the firewall configurations right here. What we've got here is actually solid firewall rule set. I like it because it's, it's allowing specifically certain relationships to happen. And this is something you can talk about during an interview. Be like, I, I understand how to make explicit firewall rules that allow only particular relationships to happen, only sp particular connections to happen. And in this case, I want to have three things happen. I want to be able to connect to a SSH server. I want to be able to go to the internet and I want to be able to ping whatever I want. And if, if things don't match that, I want to kill it all. And that's what this rule at the end is. And even as I'm looking at this, we can actually make this rule a little bit better. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's go to this rule here. And what it's saying right now is that we're allowing, allowing TCP traffic from the local area network subnet to go anywhere. But I think we need to be a bit more specific. So let's go ahead and edit this rule. And remember, we're going into opt one. And it has a very specific IP address, 192.168.50.2. And so we have pass, our interface is LAN, yes. IPv4, yes. The protocol, TCP, yes. And I want to have a specific IP address. So let's go to address. And the one that's going to be is 192.168. I can type it right. 168.50.2 on port 22. So this IP address here has to have port 22. All right, that's important. And you can give it a description if you want. We apply the changes. Let's go ahead and test this right away. Beautiful. That's a better rule that we just made than it was before. So let's exit. Awesome. I love it. That machine, anybody in this network can go to that SSH server. We could make it stronger. We could make it so that only a particular IP address can get there or only a machine with a particular MAC address could get there. That would be an interesting addition to this rule set. For now, I'm actually okay with just anybody in the LAN can connect to that because what we're going to have is actually, not in this video, but we're going to have uh, permissions and authentication happening on the server itself. So even if somebody that shouldn't be connecting to that server tries to connect to it, they're not going to be able to do anything because they're being denied because they're not allowed to on the server end. And over here, we've got actually a, an internet rule, but it's only HTTPS. And it's pretty simple to actually make a rule that looks like this because remember, we've got three, three ports for the internet, 80, 443, and 53. What if I take out 80? I'm still, I can still go to HTTPS with these but I can't go to uh, just a standard HTTP site. We don't want it, so let's not allow any of our users to do that. So this, this rule works. You saw, you saw me go to YouTube before, so that's great. And then I have a rule here that says, I would like to go and ping whatever I want. And I mean, this is up to you if you want to have that. I like to be able to test uh, going from one network to another network to see if a machine is live. Really, it makes no difference. We could actually deny everybody doing that. So you could disable this rule or delete it. That's fine. Um, for now, let's leave it let's leave it enabled. And then we have our kill all. So I believe the best practice would be that at the end of your rule set, because everything is sequential, that if we have some bizarro traffic, it doesn't belong. So let's just kill it. So all of this stuff works because it's sequential. Move on in life, all right? Uh, let's go to opt one and see what we have happening over here. And so the server actually currently is allowed to go to the internet and it can go to potentially insecure websites. So let's, let's actually kill that rule. Let's delete it. It's gone. Uh, apply changes. And then over here, I'm allowing actually the server to ping whomever I want but I actually don't want that either. So let's get rid of that. This server can't go anywhere. However, because of our stateful firewall, my opt one right now has no firewall rules. It, that server, that Debian server can't go to the internet. It can't even reach out to this Kali, but let's take a look at something. Let's go ahead and ping that machine. It still works. 
this packet right here is showing me that it's being received from the Debian server. But I have firewall rules that are not allowing that supposedly to happen. It's because a state is being remembered. So Kali sends traffic across the PFSense firewall. It makes it to its destination. And because a state is remembered inside of that firewall, the traffic coming back looks at that state and says, a state was made from a trusted zone. Let's go back to where we started. And we can see that in action uh, right here, which is great. Let's summarize what we've done today. So this is a basic cyber lab. It's not overly complicated. And believe me, your home labs don't need to be crazy. I mean, they can get there and that's awesome. And it's really awesome to like talk about your, your crazy fun home lab, but it needs to start somewhere. And if you're looking for a place to start, this is great. We've got a, we've got a client, we've got a server, we've got a router with two separate networks. We've got firewall rules that are allowing particular relationships to happen Inside of our PFSense, we've got DHCP that's configured. We've got static IP addresses. We've got dynamic IP addresses. All of these things are wonderful things to talk about during your interview. All right. I hope you enjoyed. I enjoyed chatting with you today. Have a wonderful day. See ya.